Hey everybody, this is Eric Mueller, the host of The Eric Mueller Show. I'm joined today by Riggs Eckleberry, a tech pioneer dedicated to revolutionizing the trillion dollar water industry and the founding CEO of Origin Clear. Let's head on over to the interview. Riggs, welcome to the show. Thank you, Eric. It's a great pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you on. And Riggs, before we dive deep into this entrepreneurial story of yours and really your expertise regarding disruption in the water industry, we want to know what makes up your success portfolio. So if you're new to this show, a quick background on it, a way to view it is to think of an investment portfolio, maybe your 401k or some type of stock portfolio you have. It's that compilation of assets that lays that foundation for financial goals. Well, here on the Eric Mueller Show, I want to discover how successful people like Riggs invest in themselves and really build that foundation for their success. So Riggs, start us off here. What are some skills or traits, habits or mindsets that make up that success portfolio for you? Well, thank you, Eric. The the main thing is, is appetite for risk is key, right? These days, there's so much clutter. There's so, you know, let's say you, I'm going to start an Amazon business. Well, that's already such a cluttered space that you're going to have to do something really innovative. And the other super important thing is apprenticing, learning to know the space, right? Where I've made mistakes, like, you know, I believe in, in creative, making mistakes creatively, you know, you know, fail early, fail often, but know the underlying business you're in. I think that's key. Then you can experiment. If, if you just go, well, okay, I'm just going to start, you know, messing around. You waste a lot of time and energy and you'll, 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 you know, get losses at what you're doing. So, so that's really the, the number one thing that over time that I, that I got, which was this, this knowledge of how markets tick, of how to make change happen. And I must say it was an incredibly eclectic journey. I, it made no sense until I got here. Yeah, it's kind of weird how that that works sometimes, right? You look back and and then think, what what are the steps that maybe could have happened to 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 diverge you down a different path? But do you believe that you did you end up kind of where you're meant to be as a whole? I mean, do you kind of believe in somewhat of a of a destiny per se that you were always meant to be where you are now, or do you or do you think you have made very deliberate choices that that led you to that path? Judgment really is an instant decision based on the widest possible factors, right? from self to family, corporation, on, on on out. And the more embraceive it is, the more successful it is. I remember when I, I was in on the, the fall of a great company called Quarterdeck back in the day. And one of the technologies they had was it was the technology that ended up becoming WebEx. And at the time I was in there as the head of strategic marketing, <laughs> there was no strategy, so it was really interesting. But anyway, it was uh, I was running strategic marketing and Super Ayer, who was the, he was doing business development there. He says, Riggs, I've been given the choice of anything I want as this company falls apart, what should I get? I said, I said, get this technology. This is going to be hot. Well, he did. And of course it became WebEx. And here's what's ironic is that fast forward about a year, I'm in a consultancy and I'm helping Subra build his company and so forth. And at the time it was branded Active Touch. That's a little, little piece of trivia. I think to this day, the server is called Active Touch. But anyway, at the same time, I had a brand new baby and I was super fixated on a secure paycheck, right? Like, okay, got to make sure that I, you know, raise the kid. And so he was like, hey, come on up to Sunnyvale. We might do something. And then somebody else said, hey, Riggs, we're going to do. And the the other guy was just so peremptory. He was like, yeah, this is going to happen. And it worked out fine. I ended up moving to Clearwater, Florida for a year, which is where I'm again now. And then that led to migrating to Boulder for another startup. And I had a lot of fun. What WebEx, you know, jumping into WebEx could have made a serious difference from my financial portfolio. But I I just don't think that I was ready. I think that's really the key. I had been an entrepreneur my whole life and uh, I ended up in this corporation, Quarterdeck, which is a public company in 1995. And I just wasn't corporate. I wasn't corporate. And it took me a solid 10 years to get there. And today I'd be like, yeah, okay, I get it. You know, I know what to do. So I think it's important. So I, I don't see it as, as a loss. Well, it's they say that your greatest expense is the money you didn't make. Okay, fine. I, I did. I had a huge expense there, but just as easy could have not worked out. I could have just, you know, not really acclimated well. Uh, I did not know the corporate game, which has caused a lot of friction inside Quarterdeck. I was, I was, definitely the outsider there. So as a result, I think it did work out for the best. The important thing is, as long as you just pursue what you believe you love and you really are intent about, 
things will work out. Yeah. And I think it, it also brings me to think really about like what, it, what is success or what do you define that to be? So obviously looking back, you know, had you made a different choice or, you know, maybe had that, that monetary windfall that, that could have been looked at as successful and based on a metric, you know, you had X amount of dollars, but maybe that could have led to an additional aspect that would not lead to happiness or success for you. So it could be a little bit difficult looking back on your life. And those of you listening, I mean, I'm sure you can think of moments where you could think, oh, had I done this, I wish I would have done that. I have, I have several of those too, where it's like you think of where you might be, but it does, like you just shared, Riz, it, it, it does work out if you're you know, pursuing something that you are at least passionate about or, or you feel is going to bring you fulfillment. But I would ask you, what, what, what would you define success to be right now? And how has that definition changed for you over time, if at all? I think success is being in a position to make the maximum amount of change happen within your capabilities, right? I, th I think that's really success. You know, many an entrepreneur ends up being successful and there he is, got the big house and okay, now what? You know, so I think a sense of mission is uh, super important that you can achieve. It's very important to, to know what you're capable of. Now, I tend to be overambitious. I tend to bite off more than I can chew. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It does mean you're going to have to do a lot of backfilling, like, whoops, I better get up to speed on this fast, raise somebody fast, get a team fast. But that's just because I get bored easily. And that's kind of how it is. Yeah. And, and another piece that I think is interesting, and you mentioned maybe a little bit about this pre-interview, but mistake-based marketing. So a process that you've spent decades refining this process of how to do and learn things. Would you share with us what that, what that means, what that term means, and also how might it be different than just like failing with style or failing, you know, without any, any end goal in mind? Right. That's, that's a really good distinction because when I went and spent that year in Clearwater working for a great man, Mike Sarek, who, who had a call center, we were trying to create products for that call center to sell. And I would literally put up a product. We had websites by then. It was 1996, 97. We had websites. And so I'd put up a website and, da -da -da, and then I'd, that tear it down. And he'd look at me like, Riggs, you just created a whole product line and then just disappeared it. I'm like, yeah, it's not going to work. He was kind of blown away, but that was the beginning of this idea of mistake-based marketing. And it especially got acute after the year 2000, because up to the year 2000, we had budgets to do market surveys. After 2000, we didn't. Like, no, we're not going to do any, no, $30,000 for a re uh, survey project? No, I don't think so. And so the only possible survey was just try it out, right? Since we it's an electronic world, it was it was became super feasible. Now, where I refined it was, for example, later on I was brought in to help yellowpages.com eventually get an exit. And I <clears throat> I had to reinvent how they were selling. Well, what 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 I realized after I was there for a while was the people on the floor were very good salespeople, but they didn't have product. And so again, okay, fine, let's come up with new products, skyscraper ads and this and that, boom, 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 boom. And now they had things to sell and that things took off. Then I did a project where I went, okay, every one of these merchants in Yellow Pages, they need a website. And that was back then, this is now 2002. Most of them didn't, still didn't have a website, e-commerce site. So why don't we have a little Java mini site once when you, when you look at a merchant, boop, a little mini website pops up and you can transact with them. You can call them. You can do this, that, other thing. And we developed it into a thing. And right then, in the, and that was part of what got us sold to the Bell South Consortium that bought yellowpages.com. Well, it never happened because this is the thing about, about mergers and acquisitions. They're highly destructive. The people who are buying you, they generally don't care about what you've got unless it's in revenue or customer base. The rest, eh, you know, technology, whatever. And so I clearly remember presenting this really cool prototype of a mini website for yellowpages.com to an audience that was like, yeah, whatever. We just do, we just want the listings. It's called Yellow Pages. We just want an electronic version of the yellow book. That's it. You know, they wanted to keep it simple. And that's that's the the other big factor is selling your vision is you know, ultra critical. When I was still at Quarterdeck, we had a wonderful product called Web Compass. And Web Compass was a meta search tool. It, it could search every search engine. And back then we had a number of them. And it was not as consolidated as it's today. So it would crawl every single search engine in real time and return these super natural language results. It was amazing. And it was being sold for $120 a, a piece by a call center. 
And I'm like, this is not a utility. This this needs to be free. And and I pitched it to the board of directors of Quarterdeck, and they were like, well, we, that sounds like an that sounds like an OEM deal. We don't we don't like OEM deals. I'm like, no, it's to get eyeballs. And anyway, I I did not. It didn't, it didn't work. I didn't, I was not able to convince them and web compass faded away. So key lesson there is, is really, you know, getting internal sales, especially a corporation are critical. Now there is a factor that is inevitable in, 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 in corporations that have existing product lines, which Clayton Christensen wrote about in a book called the innovators dilemma wonderful book. One of the industries he tracked was the disk drive industry, which went from 28-inch 20 20 platters, 14-inch, 7-inch, 3.5-inch, all the way down to a little chip. Now, every single stage destroyed the previous company. And that's because the sales model for 28-inch platters was, you know, I don't know, $80,000 a platter or whatever it was, right? And there was no way they were going to cut their price to 18000 for this newfangled thing. It was going to destroy all their sales. And so they could not. And so literally the technologies were developed in those legacy companies. The engineers that developed it went and created a new company that destroyed the old one. And this happened again and again and again and again, right? So no amount of selling, those engineers could not have sold it. It's like, no, no way. We're not departing from our successful business. We're, we're sticking with our model because it works. It works. Obviously it works. Yeah, okay, but you're driving into a wall, right? Technology is a hell of a thing. Again, going back to Quarterdeck, there I was strategic marketer, and there was something called a memory manager at the time. 286 computers, these old pre-Windows operating systems, they had a 640K memory limit. And if you needed to do more than that, you had to have a memory manager. And the preeminent one was QEMM, Quarterdeck Expanded Memory Manager. It was a huge tentpole for the company. And I went over... I just made my bones by marketing a one of the first Windows 95 applications, Clean Sweep. And, I, and now I'm in strategic marketing. I walk over to the head of sales and I say, dude, QEMM is falling off a cliff. You realize that, right? Because it it's the world is moving over to Windows 95. Just so you know, it's a 32-bit operating system. That memory issue goes away. He was like, I don't think so. Again, you've got to predict trends. Now, what's wild is even though these things become obsolete and they hit the wall, they still have a life. A good friend of mine has a product called Disk Keeper, which defragments disks. Well, it still sells to this day, even though it's become more and more obsolete. Why? Because of installed bases. So, you know, it's important to remember that that does, does exist. But I, I'm interested in the new stuff. That's what gets me excited, not marketing legacy stuff and, and milking the last dollars out of it, right? Yeah. And that, that kind of leads into what maybe you're doing now at, at Origin Clear. So it sounds like, I mean, you've shared you know, some of your, some of your experience in the background that you've had, which is also, you know, a pretty varied career, which I would assume makes you feel, you know, pretty qualified to be a CEO of a company such as Origin Clear, which you also helped found the company that, that became what it is now. What, what really is the vision behind Origin Clear and how is it, you know, trying to disrupt the water industry, which honestly, I don't know a ton about the inner workings of the water industry. So maybe, maybe even shed some light on on really how it works. And it sounds like an industry that maybe is a little bit adverse to change. Yes. And I'll get into that. But uh, to, speaking to your your thing about background, the problem with there, there's a shortage of CEOs. There was during the, during the dot-com era, I think there was uh, 180 open CEO recs in Silicon Valley. I didn't give a moment. It was uh, tremendous. Why? Well, um, my ability to be a CEO really came from my, I, I was a ship captain back in the day. In the 70s, I was actually captaining large ships, merchant ships, and so forth. A job for which, again, becoming a ship captain, there's no real apprenticeship. One day you're it. You're like, okay, hard left rudder. And that happened, right? So, yeah. But you also, so if you, what you say magically happens, make it so first, right? But you, it's like, I don't know what's going to happen next. And so it's a really tough school. No amount of apprenticeship at lower levels of being a first mate or whatever prepares you for that. And so you have to, and then later, having been a captain already, and I then was a first mate for a while, and I was able to be a very good first mate again, because I'd been a captain, I could, could anticipate what the captain needed. So what I'm trying to say here is, these are jobs that you just have to accumulate a lot of eclectic background for, 
before you, so you'll be able to adapt because there's no, there's no school, there's no CEO school out there. Okay. So I was happily taking a company public in 2006 called Cyber Defender. We got it onto the NASDAQ. I was, I was the number two. So I was the chief operating officer and president. And like all number twos, I thought I could be a better number one. I mean, that's a standard, right? So I called up these fund managers that I know. And I said, you know, I'd like to, I think I could be a CEO. And they go, Riggs, I th we think so too, but we're not going to, we're not doing high tech. We were shifting over into green and you can be a CEO, but you, we, we want you to do an algae to biofuels startup. Like, okay, sure. Why not? Fortunately, I have a brilliant inventor brother, Nicholas, who happened to have a patent <laughs> that would apply uh, a patent for oxygenating the algae, helping to grow it, whatever. And so we launched this company and it was Origin Oil. Now, the fund I was working with, what they like to do is take you public immediately and then raise money in the public space as opposed to lengthy rounds A through G and then go public, right? Two different philosophies. And they, if you do one, you're poison for the other. It's over. Like from day one, when I went public, VCs didn't want to talk to me. And it was probably a good thing because I'm, VCs try to control you with that monthly meeting, and I'm not good about that. But anyway, so so I, we started this thing, and it was so much fun pushing this algae to biofuels idea. Um, but that unfortunately hit a wall in 2014 when fracking really took over the market, and the price of oil crashed so low that we were multiples too expensive to compete with fossil fuels. We just it just algae became, as I like to say, a science experiment. At that point, we're like, okay, failure is not an option. We're not going to just shut down. Uh, and I don't want to become an algae supplement company. So what do we do? And the tech we had at the time for algae extraction could be adapted to sewage extraction. So we went blithely into the water industry. Well, in algae, I had been a media darling. You know, Stuart Varney had called me algae man. I'll call you algae man. You know, I was on CNBC. I was on all these major networks because it was a who. Who knew? Like, whoa, that's interesting. It was one of those unusual things. Water? Yeah, whatever, right? And because people like, in fact, one of my fund managers said, I don't get it, Riggs. I flush the toilet, the water goes away. I turn on the faucet, the water comes in. What's the big deal? I'm like, but it's all falling apart. And that's the fact is that I became quickly aware that our water infrastructure is very sick. It's in deep trouble. And it's being underlined by these little canary and coal mine events like Flint, Michigan, and so forth. But there's much more happening that is just not being talked about. For example, uh, you can go to a tap water database called ewg.org slash tap water, environmental working group, and look up your zip code. And it will tell you, oh, your zip code is fully compliant with federal regulations, but it's 2,000% too much arsenic by, 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 by current science. But like the water industry is like, no. No, no current science. <laughs> Don't update anything, please. They they did they updated the arsenic rules in in California a, a few years ago, and it threw the whole water industry there into a tizzy. Like, oh lord, what do we do? Well, so they're overloaded, and here's the the number one reason why: ninety percent of the burden on municipal infrastructure is industry and agriculture, and it's growing, and it gets more toxic, and it's going to get worse. Because you know what's coming next is deglobalization and all the manufacturing is coming back to America. And we're not ready. We're just not ready. 